Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's GIBCO Galaxy Tour webinar on genome editing, disease modeling to novel therapeutics. My name is Michelle Ashton, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For those of you attending our live session today, the GIBCO scientists will be discussing the development of next generation disease models and strategies for moving CRISPR-based therapies to the clinic. You will get to learn about the genome editing workflow, the various innovations to improve pluripotent stem cell disease model construction, and the workflow solutions which enable clinical and commercial scale manufacturing of T-cell therapeutics. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our two speakers for today. Our first speaker, Dr. Eric Willems, in the Cell Biology R&D Senior Manager of Thermo Fisher Scientific. Dr. Willems was trained as a stem cell biologist in Brussels, Belgium, where he obtained his PhD in 2007. He currently leads a team in Thermo Fisher Scientific that focuses on pluripotent stem cell-based customer-driven projects and product applications, including characterization, reprogramming, genome editing, differentiation, and disease modeling with a focus on drug discovery applications. Now in the stem cell field for over 15 years, Dr. Willems published numerous peer-reviewed articles, including in high-impact journals such as stem Cell Stem Cell. Our second speaker, Dr. Jason Potter, is the R&D Director of Genome Editing and Thermo at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Dr. Potter leads the genome editing R&D group at Carlsbad, California, and is focused on developing and improving tools for genome editing using the Talon and CRISPR technologies. He has spent 20 years working in biotech R&D and previously led research focusing on synthetic genes and the development of enzymes including superscript 3 and other reverse transcriptase and polymerase at Life Technologies. Let us welcome Dr. Eric Williams, Willems to start his presentation. Hi, T today I will be sharing um, a little story around how you can use genome editing uh, in iPSCs to create disease models to advance your research. So as we all know, cell models are important, uh, not just to you know, understand human biology, but also in terms of developing drugs and, and therapies um, to, to help mitigate disease. So when you think about human biology, there's a lot of inputs like genetics, the environment, nutrition or drugs, and th those inputs then uh, result in number of outputs, you know, it could be symptoms or certain biomarkers or the way we feel. And so when you think about modeling that in an in vitro situation, you kind of want to try and mimic those inputs um, so that you can do some in vitro analysis and, and do your biological study. So when you think about inputs in an in vitro model, we're thinking about overexpression, of knocking in of genes, you have knockdowns or knockouts, you can use different media systems, different small molecules. Um, and then those changes that are introduced will then drive alterations in gene expression, protein function, cell or phenotypes or cell health. So all these things are, you know, sort, sort of critical to think from a human body to an in vitro system and how you make those transitions. In, into the model. And so with the innovations of pluripotent stem cells, as well as genome editing, um, we have now a very simple way to generate disease models in vitro so that you can then um, generate your disease model of interest through pluripotent stem cells. You know, these cells can be easily expanded 
engineered and differentiated and it's very scalable for high throughput screening so you can do a lot with these cells and then you can bring in genome editing technologies using a variety of different nucleases to knock out disease relevant genes to mimic mutations that are showing up in patients or you can overexpress disease relevant genes or correct expression of disease causing mutations all all to facilitate disease modeling in vitro so when you think about the genome editing portion, um, as most of you probably know, you basically use engineered nucleases to make changes in the genome of the cell. And so there are sort of three major modifications that you can make um, relevant to disease. So the first one would be a SNP change, which you can introduce using homology-driven repair mechanisms where you know, these single SNP mutations oftentimes cause disease in, in patients, and you can either correct those or insert them in a healthy patient line. Um, and then secondly, for disease relevance, there's a gene knockout situation where, you know, often mutations lead to knockouts of genes or you have full deletions of genes causing the disease. And so we can mimic that as well using uh, genome engineering and then a third approach that's commonly used is larger gene insertions or knock-ins, which you know are relevant in, in terms of additional copies of genes that emerge in, in particular disease as well. So when you think about using the IPSC model to um, generate some disease models, you basically have to think about, you know, you have your disease line and then you have your healthy line and so you can think about this two ways in, in one way you would take a healthy donor where you then use the genome editing technology to introduce a mutation into the genome to have a disease mimic um, cell line or you take a um, ipsc line from a patient where you then go in and correct a mutation to a normal situation so that in both cases, you have a pair of iPSC cells that you can then differentiate um, for your model. So what, what I wanted to do today is spend a little bit of time on how you go about designing a um, disease model pair in iPSCs, and then I'll, I'll get, go in a little um, show uh, case study that we've uh, done there. So. First, of course, is, you know, how, how do you design a genome editing experiment? Um, evidently, um, the first component that you use is a um, nucleus. In this case, um, I'm going to talk about the Cas9 nucleus, very widely used, very efficient. And that system ex um, exists in, in two pieces. So you have the Cas9 nucleus, which is a protein in many cases, and then you have a guide RNA, which basically targets the Cas9 to your locus of interest. And so what we've done at Thermo Fisher is we developed a um, design tool that's available online. It's called our True Design Genome Editor and basically allows you to very simply design your genome editing experiment. So in, in this case, we're going to be looking at the LARC2 G2019S SNP change. And so what you do is you go into the True Design tool you in this case you select snip edit but there's also other editing um, achievements that you can select from and then you would click next and in that window you can then um, indicate your gene of interest so you can either do that by selecting the chromosome location or you can simply choose the gene name and then the system will populate the uh, gene information for you with exon intron information. It will give you the amino acid sequence of, of, of your protein as well. So it's, it's a very visual uh, representation of the gene. And then in, you know, in that next step, then you, you see that when you search for exact coordinates that the system will take you to that exact coordinate within your gene so that you can then start looking at making your genetic change. And so to make your genetic change is, is very simple. You basically choose through the system what change you wanna make after you've selected your base that you want to change. So in this case, we selected the G and we want to change that to an A. 
So you select that in, and then basically the tool recognizes it. You click next on the tool, and you know your job is done. And then the tool will work on the design. So in this case, you see here that the tool has identified a guide RNA that sits very close to the in, uh, mutation of interest. And then what the tool will do is it'll identify multiple guide RNAs if they are available. And then it will rank them in a table, as you can see here, for the one guide RNA. And based on the sequence and the binding affinity of the guide RNA, the different guide RNAs will then be ranked. And the ones checked with the green uh, check mark, such as the one in this example, are then recommended. And you can then order those dir directly through the through design platform. In addition, the tool will also generate sequences for the single-stranded donor RNA. So in case of a SNP change, we typically use a um, 8200 base pair uh, single-stranded oligo that carries the mutation that we're changing. And so all these tools are readily designed um, and allow you to order them and uh, get going on your Platform. So in terms of uh, donors and guide RNA, True Design takes care of everything for you. The next question then, of course, is, you know, I want to use my Cas9 nuclease. Um, you know, what, what form do I use? Because we have the, um, the plasmid version available. It's an all-in-one plasmid that both you would have your guide RNA and the Cas9 uh, expression cassette. We then also have our CRISPR mRNA, and then we have our, our true cut Cas9 family of proteins. Um, you know, the, the application really is going to drive this, um, the need here. In, in our case for IPSC, the protein delivery method is the most efficient for IPSC editing. So that is the one we would choose here. Um, you know, pro protein has a number of different advantages in terms of short half-life, direct activity. It can be co-transfected with the guide RNA. Um, you know, it's it's very very straightforward to work with. So the question then, of course, becomes: How do we delete? Um, sorry. Um, so in terms of the true cat cast true cat cast nine proteins that we have available. We have our standard Cas9 protein, which is developed for maximum editing efficiency. We also have our high fidelity Cas9 protein. It has a little bit less off targets compared to the original TrueCut protein. We're still um, efficient on target editing. And then recently we also launched our CTS TrueCut Cas9 uh, protein, which is useful for in vivo um, and cell therapy applications. So once you've selected your protein, in this case, we will choose the maximum editing efficiency. Um, and then you know we'll have to look at delivery. So in terms of delivering to iPSCs, there are two main delivery platforms that work well. And you know the selection of the tool is going to depending on on your needs and, and availability of instruments. Um, on the one hand, you have a lipofection-based reagent um, that can deliver the RNP complexes as well as DNA or, or RNA if interested. Um, you know, it's, it's very portable. It's very easy to get to. Um, there's good protocols out there. Um, on the other hand, there's the neon electroporation system, which basically delivers the RNP through electroporation. It's a lot more efficient delivery, it does cause a little bit more stress on the cells, but in general, we find that the uh, neo electroporation um, works better for delivery of, of editing tools. And that, that's indicated in this slide here. So in light blue, you have the editing efficiency across a number of targets um, in, in two IPSC lines. Um, for the lipofectamine stem reagent, and then in dark blue, you have that same um, result with the neon transfection system. And as you can you can see with the neon transfection system, you have significantly higher editing efficiency when using the same tools compared to the lipofectamine stem reagent. But that said, in, in four of the five targets that we've looked at, there is still sufficient enough 
editing uh, going on that would allow you to successfully isolate your cell lines of interest. So knowing this, you can then, um, having those tools selected, you can then uh, leverage our innovations across the IPSC portfolio to help um, building your um, disease models. So, you know, the, talked about the gene ed genome editing tools. We also have a variety of different media systems and cell matrices specifically designed for genome editing workflows. And then we also have the differentiation portions that will help you um, generate your disease model and then also the instrumentation to do the phenotyping. So what I wanted to do next is, is go into a case study that we had done um, in, in terms of taking a healthy IPSC line and then generating a number of different uh, disease-causing mutations. So in the example here, um, we took a healthy IPSC line and then introduced a number of SNPs that are known to be um, associated with neuronal as well as cardiac disease in this slide. So as you can see, in terms of homology-driven repair shown by the dark blue, dark blue bars in, in the middle there, you see that the editing efficiency is, is you know, heavily target dependent, but in, in most cases we, we do identify a good number of um, homology-driven repair. And then similarly for indels, um, we've noted that, you know, the editing efficiency, so basically just making a double strand of break in the DNA is, is widely variable from target to target, but again, had, had a pretty high efficiency. So then, you know, of course, you, you see that it's it's very challenging to achieve 100% editing, and that's where uh, in, in pluripotent stem cells, you know, an, an extra cloning step is required to isolate your cell lines of interest. So spend some time optimizing single cell cloning of iPSC using cell sorter, because cell sorters really give you the highest confidence that you are indeed depositing single cells into 96 well plates. So we did a fairly stringent um, gating strategy here where you know we do a number of um, scatter gates to ensure that we're dealing with single cells. And then in addition, we added some gating around functionality of the cell. So we isolated cells that are expressing trial 160 very highly, uh, indicative of pluripotency. And then we also weeded out the dead cells by um, sorting out uh, propidium iodide negative cells. And those cells were then deposited in a number of different media and substrates to identify which condition was the best. And, um, you know, in, in this system, we then found out that uh, using Stemflex and Laminin 521 was most efficient for uh, cloning out iPSC. So when you then sequence all those clones, um, you know, not, not unexpectedly, there is some correlation between the number of edited clones that we find and the overall editing efficiency in the pools that we've identified. And so, in as you can see, when we have high editing efficiency in the pool, we have a much higher incidence of homozygous or heterozygous SNP corrected cell lines compared to those where the editing efficiency was lower. And so, in, in this case, um, you know, for the TNNT2R141W mutation, uh, which is a mutation that causes a uh, cardiac disease, we then wanted to take it further and do some functional analysis. So basically, kind of summarize the model here is that we, we took that clonally isolated cell line to then um, dive, dive deeper into the dilated cardiomyopathy model. And so we, we took the IPSC line and first, of course, QC that line to make sure that it is a fully, fully pluripotent cell line and then always compare that with its parental cell line. So um, as you can see on the TACMAN uh, pluripotency scorecard panel, which is a, a qPCR-based panel, we see very similar readouts in terms of pluripotency and you know, la lack of differentiation within the culture. Um, we then furthermore looked at our pluritest assay, which is a whole genome transcripto microarray-based technology to quickly assess the um, pluripotency of, of your iPSC. And when 
your cell lines land in the red cloud, which is represented by over 400 different iPSC lines, you know, you can be assured that your pluripotency is, is on, on par with, with a, a normal iPSC line. So then evidently we also um, check the sequence. So using next generation sequencing, we looked at hundred thousands of reads here and to ensure that the, um, you know, it, mutation was present across the cell line, that there weren't any any sort of clonal clonality issues. Um, and then, you know, we, we also looked at the uh, genomic stability using the karyostate assay, so it's sort of a digital karyotyping uh, approach to show that the genome editing workflow, which is relatively harsh on the iPSCs, did not have any um, adverse effects. So once we knew that the iPSC line was good, we then moved on into differentiation. We compared it to, to its parental cell line. And as you can see here, um, you know, using our cardiomyocyte differentiation kit, we were able to get cardiomyocytes both from the wild type as well as the parental cell line. And, um, you know, showing some typical markers for cardiomyocytes such, such as troponin two in red and actin in one in green we have cardiomyocyte formation both in the parental as well as uh, disease line. And then, of course, you know, the big question is, well, do we see any sort of uh, phenotypes that could be mimicking what is happening with the disease in patients? So you, using these derived cardiomyocytes, we then did some functional analysis of those cells in, in a high throughput setting. So basically we used a fluofore assay, which basically is a dye that responds to calcium. And as cardiomyocytes contract spontaneously, calcium is being pumped in and out of the cell continuously. So we can use that fluofore measurement as a way to visualize contraction in cardiomyocytes in a high throughput setting. And so what you can immediately see when you look at the calcium transients of the um, control line versus the, the mutated line is that you see that there's a delay in, in, in the peak. So the peak is longer compared to control. And then, you know, that clearly over time indicates that those cardiomyocytes are beating slower compared to their control cell line. And that's shown in a graph on the top right. So there's a slight decrease in the beat rate of the mutate, uh, mutated iPSC cells. Um, but more interestingly, we then try to challenge those cardiomyocytes to see whether we could elicit some phenotypes that have been known um, to be associated with, with the disease as well. So. Uh, using isoproteranol, which is a mimic of the adrenergic receptor. So, you know, basically mimicking adrenaline. If we treat the cells with that on the bottom left, you see in a DMSO vehicle control, the cells are beating at a regular pace. And then at the white line there, the compound gets dialed in. When you add in DMSO, nothing happens to the beat rate. Whereas if you add the isoproteranol, you see a, a rapid increase of the beat rate in control cells. Now, inter interestingly, when you look on the right-hand side at the mutant, you see that the isoproteranol challenge initially increases the beat rate, but then the cardiomyocytes just stop beating altogether, meaning you know they could not handle that um, adrenaline stimulation and they just stop contracting. So th this is indicative of um, similarities with, with the actual disease in patients and, and this kind of model can now be used to screen for further drugs that could um, you know, ameliorate these, these issues with isoproteranol, for example. So to sort of summarize um, the generation of the disease model is that, you know, from a genome editing point of view, we have a number of innovations and tools that can help you um, for, for the design of your experiment. The True Design Editor really enables you to generate tools quickly. Um, and then in addition, you know, we have a number of, of media and matrix systems that really enable the uh, 
processing of the iPSC through the genome editing workflow, um, you know, facilitated single cell cloning is, is, is a, a key achievement of those media systems. And then we have the tools available as well to uh, differentiate to cell type of interest as well as the uh, analysis of them. So when you think about Thermo Fisher uh, in terms of the iPSC disease modeling uh, environment, you know, we, we really have the tools and workflows to do everything, um, going from taking a donor from a patient, uh, you can do sequence analysis of that patient. Um, we can then uh, reprogram them into iPSC. We have the media systems to grow those iPSC. We have the tools to characterize the iPSC. We have all the tools available to engineer the genome of the iPSC to help you mimic your disease. And as mentioned, we also have the tools available for uh, differentiation, as well as the instrumentation to do the analysis. And with that, I will wrap up my presentation and thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Eric, for the insightful session on leveraging genome editing of iPSCs to create disease models. Next, I would like to invite Jason to share more about applications of CRISPR genome editing technologies for cell therapy. Hi, hello, I'm Jason Potter. I'm a director of genome engineering here at Thermo Fisher. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about some of the considerations uh, when you're developing applications for using CRISPR genome editing and for cell therapies. So glad you're all here. Uh, today, I'm gonna to be talking about the evolution of CRISPR moving towards therapeutic development, and then talk through a couple of genome editing tools, uh, all the way from the design of the experiment through the implementation in uh, relevant cell types. And then talk through also, how do you go from early research, kind of preclinical work, uh, all the way through clinical implementation. And this, we're gonna be using the example of the Cas9 RMP complex and why that's good and uh, the use of GMP reagents. So to start off with, over the last few years, uh, since the advent of CRISPR back about, <laughs> There's about 12 years now, um, there's been a rapid increase in the use of CRISPR and the many applications of it. We're all aware of that. But over the last couple of years, what we're starting to see is clinical application. And the use of this um, is gonna be used more and more for gene therapy. We have the early gene therapy trials that aren't, aren't necessarily using CRISPR, um, but the CRISPR applications Oh, I'd say with Intelia, CRISPR Therapeutics, and others are really hitting the mainstream now and working to the point where we're starting to see the hope that this will become a mainstream uh, therapeutic use so that instead of just rare diseases, it'll be applied to um, more common diseases and kind of move to the cure instead of everyday treatment. So, we see these trials, we see different versions. The most common thing that we've seen is CRISPR-Cas9, and the most common model that you'll see is the sickle cell. And that's because it's a pretty understood uh, disease, and it's straightforward on what you need to do to be able to treat it. So that has been the most common model going forward. And I'm not going to talk too much about that. So for T-cell engineering, which is another application um, that has been showing a lot of promise, one of, the main re one of the main ways of going about it now is with lentivirus uh, payloads. And these are used to deliver the CAR complex so that you can modify the receptors and target the T-cells towards your uh, epitope of interest. The limitations to the lentivirus is mostly around cost. The safety is pretty good, but there's always the concern about using a viral uh, vector. And the main reason for that safety concern is lentivirus do random integration. 
And so there's the concern of what if it integrates in the wrong spot? Um, there's limits on insert size. As you get bigger, it gets harder. Uh, there's limits on multiplexing. It just starts to having to have multiple complexes to be able to do that. And it's a bit challenging towards allogeneic just because you're limited on how you can target. Since it's random incorporation, if you need to do specific things and kind of aim for a specific clone, it can be done, but it's a harder tool to be used. And that's why we're seeing more use of gene editing approaches, sometimes in lentivirus also. But the main reason for these is it's very efficient to target and knock out a gene that you want in a manner that you want. You can bring in new payloads, uh, knock these in, uh, and that's getting very efficient uh, using AAV as a donor. And of course, you know, there's broad IP here. And so when you're thinking about how I'm gonna do it, do you have access? You know, that's, that's a concern when you're figuring out these types of therapies. So when you're using gene editing, when you're using Cas9 or other tools, there's a couple of terms that we use. Um, all of these are gonna be directly cutting the DNA. And so these are, we call them nucleases because they're gonna be making a double strand cut. That double strand cut can have a couple of outcomes. One of those outcomes is a knockout, and that's essentially when the DNA is cut and it comes together and it has kind of a random indel. And that indel uh, disrupts the codons and causes the gene to be interrupted and thereby not expressed appropriately. You can also do that with a small donor that puts like a stop codon, so you have a more controlled outcome. And then there's something called knock-in, and knock-in is where you want to open up the genome and put something new in, whether that's a car cassette, whether that's a tag, like a GFP tag, you can put new DNA in there, and there it has to be very specific. You want to be able to get it in frame, you want to be able to get it at the proper terminus if you're tagging. And so this technique is a little bit harder, and it depends on the efficiency of the nuclease to cut. So for cutting, the nucleases that we generally use at Thermo Fisher is we have the talons, and the talons are a good tool that give you really good specificity and cutting efficiency. Um, not going to talk further about those today, but if you are interested in talons, um, you can reach out to us and we can talk further about it. The main tools that we use is the CRISPR-Cas9, and we use this as a protein, uh, occasionally as an mRNA or as a lentiviral. And the way that the CRISPR-Cas9 works, of course, is you've got the protein and then you have a guide RNA that you complex with it. And then this complex together is what does the targeted cutting. So when you think through the workflow, what are you gonna be doing? Uh, the first step is you choose kind of your design. Are you going to be going, which nuclease are you going to be using? Um, what is your target? Uh, and there's many tools, including tools from us, that help you design for your target and either uh, make a tell or make a guide or any design for that. And then you can also design your experiment to tag um, whatever you like for that. And so from this, you would order your Cas9 nuclease, you'd order your guide RNAs, You'd make your donor, your donors or use kits to be able to bring in your donors. And then the other parts that you would be doing as far as uh, design part is, do you want to do a loss of function library? And so here you may be looking at, say, a kinase library. You want to know if you knocked out a kinase, does it have an effect on your model? And so we also have lentiviral libraries, which has all of the kinases with guide RNA so that you can very efficiently in a RAID format, knock them out and then grow up your cells and see, is there a phenotype, uh, a growth defect or anything that you can see that indicates that kinase was important for your disease or for the model that you're studying. We also can make custom libraries and we also can do, as Eric was talking about, custom cell model engineering and make exactly what you want and deliver you the cells instead of the tools for you to make those cells. Um, 
And along with that, we have analytical services on those libraries or on those tools. The workflow, of course, you figure out what you want, you order it. Uh, once you get those things, with CRISPR-Cas9, the really nice thing about it is it's, it's a quite simple reaction. You essentially just take the um, guide RNA and you complex it with your um, Cas9 protein. It's almost like setting up a PCR reaction. Uh, and then you add it to your cells. And that can be with a lipid complex like uh, an LNP or by electroporation. Uh, usually two or three days later, you're going to measure your editing and you can do that by sequencing or there's a T7 endoassay that we call the genome cleavage detection assay. And you can see if you actually cut your cells uh, at a decent rate and then you would screen for the affected clones and expand them. So pretty straightforward uh, workflow. The reason that we suggest using the protein system, we actively used plasmids, we actively used mRNA, but what we saw with the protein system is the ease of use, the simplicity of it, and thereby the effectiveness of it. When you're working with a plasmid, there's a lot of steps that have to happen, from delivery through making your mRNA transcript, complexing with your guide RNA. You know, both of those have to survive in the cell, in the nuclease environment. Uh, complex to each other, and then get back into the nuclease to edit. And so while the mRNA simplifies it a bit, you can see the protein, you pre-complex them together, it's all ready to go. The protein protects the guide RNA, so it's much more robust. And you deliver it to the cells, the protein has a strong nuclear localization signal, so it very quickly goes into the cells and has the effect. Since you are dosing it, you have the protein exactly what you want, if you need more editing, oftentimes it just means you have a higher dose of protein. You don't get interrupted by what could happen. Why didn't my plasmid express well? You're simplifying it out. And from that, we were able to rapidly optimize this system and oftentimes get very close to 100% editing with the protein system without very much optimization. And so that's one of the main reasons, robustness, ease of use, and just you know simplicity of the design for this. One of the other things that we observed when we were using this is we did Westerns on the express protein. And as you see in the lower right, uh, when you're using a plasmid, you, get, you start off with low expression, but it builds up and it stays high. So three days later, you've still got high expression of your Cas9. With your mRNA system, it's used and then it kind of turns over in a couple of cell cycles. So usually three to four days later, it's pretty cleared. And the same with the protein. You can start with a high dose and then that gets turned over because you're not making any more of it. And the cells will clear it from the system. The advantage of this is that if you're thinking about, I want to be able to cut my target, but I don't want to cut randomly or at off target within the genome, the more nuclease I have just sitting around after I've made the edit, the higher chance there is for off target. Whereas with the protein, you start with a high amount, you can get the edit that you want, and then it goes away so the off target risk is much lower. And there's several papers that have very clearly shown that the plasmid expression systems have significantly higher off target risk, even with good guide RNAs compared to the protein system. Now, here's just an example of what's going on in the cells. Uh, since the Cas9 has a strong nuclear localization signal, it's got two of those. Um, once you deliver it, you can see it's going into the cells. And here's just an example. And you can see when you overlay the Cas9 and the DAPI, uh, which is staining the nucleus, you can see it goes almost exclusively into the nucleus. So whatever you're dosing is going where you need it to be, which is where the genome is. There's not much out in the cytoplasm, and so you get a good, efficient delivery and a good, efficient uh, editing. So when you're thinking about clinical work, you know, if you're a disease model, you're thinking, I'm going to be moving this eventually to actual uh, therapeutic application. One of the things that we consider is is the tools that you're using early on in research going to be able to carry through with you to commercialization? Because there's a lot of things about stability, about supply uh, and performance 
that could change if you have to change suppliers. So we made the decision to go ahead and make a GMP version of our standard Cas9. It's the exact same construct. And uh, the only difference is we improved the purification, concentration, and the scale of this so that we would be able to potentially supply this towards any therapeutic application. What that really means is you're able to make, instead of you know micrograms or migs of this, we're making grams uh, quantity lots of this and highly pure under controlled manufacturing processes. This is also done in aseptic manufacturing, which I'll talk about in a bit and extensively safely safety tested. Lots of QCs, make sure there's no contaminants, no carryovers and safe for use in a therapeutic application. Uh, CTS, this is our cell therapy systems. This is what we use to mean GMP. And it's essentially the regulations that we're following as well as the testing and documentation rigor that goes through anything that's gonna potentially be used in an FDA approved application. So the process itself is fully controlled and fully contained uh, from fermentation all the way through vialing. These are in single use, uh, sterile, um, you're never pouring something from one thing to another. It's all piped through fused uh, tubing. And so the risk of environmental contamination is pretty much eliminated. And the risk of cross-contamination, since this is all single use, is also pretty much eliminated. And so that, along with very stringent testing, helps make sure that we have a very you know, quality product. So the QCs that we use, going to run through these, uh, there's several of them that you see here, and they're grouped up into kind of three main uh, areas. One of them is product-related impurities. So is the final purified product what we say it is? And so we have uh, purity, we check for aggregates, uh, we run this by page and HPLC to confirm that this is a very pure protein. Uh, the next part is uh, process-related impurities, is there any carryover nucleases from the E. coli that this was made in? Is there any carryover E. coli proteins or environmental proteins or DNA that have been introduced to the process, endotoxin, uh, sterility testing, and mycoplasma testing? And so we make sure that this isn't going to cause problems downstream. And then finally, characterization, just standard, make sure the concentration is what we say it is, because as I'm going to talk about further, um, since you can dose the protein, making sure that you have consistent concentration is important to make sure that you have consistent uh, editing. So how do we do this at scale? Um, what are we looking for for qualification of the Cas9 protein? We do three tests, and one of those is an in vitro assay that just confirms that the protein is cutting. Another is an in vivo testing in T cells. Uh, this is a primary T cells. This is what, you know, kind of a, a cell model that is, is commonly being used now. So you want to make sure that the protein we're making is reproducibly performing in what people are going to be using it for. And then we also check this in multiple systems. Um, Neon is a small scale electroporation, does like 10 to 100 microliters. And a xenon system is a, is a therapeutic grade, which can do, you know, mills of cells at a time, billions of cells. So first of all, this in vitro cutting assay, it's just like a restriction assay where you give it a template and you see, can I cut it? We do this across a titration of protein concentrations to get a dose curve. The reason this is important is that if you use too much Cas9, uh, you're going to get a plateau and you wouldn't be able to see if you've lost half your activity if you're well into your plateau. So when you're checking activity, you want to make sure you're in the linear area and see, am I cutting and am I cutting reproducibly across lots or across variants? And so here you can see the research grade is performing the same as the GMP grade in this cutting assay. Uh, we use this assay as we're measuring performance as we go through uh, testing, things like freeze thaw. Can you freeze and thaw these? We generally, for like a research use, you're commonly using the same vial over and over again. And you can see, Five freeze thaws doesn't really cause any difference compared to the normal. For therapeutic, 
Generally, you're not going to be opening and shutting it just because once you open it, you have the risk of contamination from your environment. Um, but if you needed to, or if you needed to open it and reallocate it, you can again see that there's really no effect from uh, at least five freeze thaws. There's also uh, how stable is the protein complex. And so we made these, we complexed them with the guide RNA, and then we left them out on the bench uh, from uh, 10 minutes to 16 hours and then checked their activity. And what was interesting is that the RMP complex is quite stable. We don't see any loss of activity uh, even after long exposures at room temperature. So we explored that a bit further and what you're seeing on the left is cell viability. This is just showing that leaving it out on the bench didn't change or cause any toxicity. And then on the right is cutting activity. And again, you can see that even out to a month, either stored uh, in a fridge at four degrees or on the bench at room temperature, and room temperature for us is around 20 degrees, um, you didn't see any significant loss of activity, which is nice uh, if you're doing lots of benchtop activities like screens. I don't really see an, uh, a therapeutic need for this because most, you know, the recommendation is use it, uh, formulate it and use it, but it does start opening up options where you can have a stable RMP complex that could be considered as a starting point. The next thing that we looked at was uh, editing efficiencies in T cells. And here again, viability stayed high across multiple targets. And you can see we tried some hard targets as well as uh, targets that seem to perform well. And both the REO and CTS perform equally well across multiple targets. So whatever you're using with our REO enzyme, when you switch over to the CTS, you can expect the same performance there. And then we compared it to other suppliers of GMP Cas9. And here, generally, if you use a lot of protein, you're gonna see the same effect. But on some of these harder targets, we did see a difference. And then when we do the titration on the right, you can see what's going on there. And essentially what you see is ours in the dark blue is effective at a lower dose, which means that either uh, the specific activity of the Cas9 we're producing is better or the NLS, uh, the nuclear localization and the efficiency of getting to the target is improved. And over these targets, you can see in each of these cases, you've got a more robust, robust enzyme with the Thermo Fisher one. And this comes into effect when you're talking about, you know, full scale costs and all that, because what you want to be targeting is you don't want to be right on a plateau where dosing considerations might cause significant differences. You want to be uh, to the left of the plateau so you get a more robust dose response. And you can see you're going to use twice as much of the competitor enzyme to be able to get that same, same um, effectiveness profile potentially. Uh, the next part is just lot to lot performance. We made three manufacturing lots of these at full scale. And you can see that all three lots across these dilution series on multiple targets, they perform uh, just about the same. So you're gonna get, it's a really well controlled process. You're gonna get the same enzyme across uh, over time. And then finally, how does this work for knocking efficiency? Um, Again, cell viability on the left, no problems with our platform. And then on the right, what you're looking at is the total editing with the number. So this is both knock in and indel. And then the light blue is the indel of a small single strand donor. So this is the insertion of six bases. And you can see that single strand donors are very effective in this system. This is gonna vary depending on your target. You see this PD-1? we could see very little indel and it would look almost all HDR. Some targets, it's the other way. You see very little HDR and you see very high indel and it depends on the sequence that you're cutting at. So this will vary, but you can see that uh, for small donors, this system can be very effective. And then also wanted to show a large donor, a CAR-T, which is around two to three KB. And here what we're showing is first you're looking at the T cells in flow in the upper left. And what you can see here is that these cells without any Cas9 or any donor, the donors delivered by AAV, um, it's all pretty much uh, no CAR, CAR would be at the top, and the T cell receptor, 91%. Once you add the Cas9, 
you can see very effective knockout of the uh, T cell receptor. And 96% of the cells now have uh, no expression of the T cell receptor. In the lower left, when you add just AAV, again, no Cas9, you again see the AAV is very ineffective. You don't see any movement to the top boxes. But once you combine all of this together, the Cas9 and the AAV donor, uh, this is bioelectroporation, again, inactivated T cells. You see a very strong shift from the lower right, which is where you're starting, to the upper left. Almost 90% of your cells have a, a knockout of the T cell receptor and a knock-in of your CAR donor. And when you use this in a killing assay, you can see that these T cells are very well targeted against the CD19 uh, cells and kill that very effectively compared to the unedited cells. Uh, when you look at these cells also for, you know, did we mess up the cells? Did we exhaust them through the process? What you're looking here is the bottom panel is the unedited cells. So none of these have the car complex, which is the upper box. And then you're comparing essentially the population across these uh, to the top population. You can see it's almost identical. The only difference is that uh, the edited cells have the car uh, inserted in that, but for exhaustion and for memory and activation, they're identical to the cells that we started with. So the process is effective and you're not hurting your cells in a manner that we can see. We also wanted to do a full kind of therapeutic workflow. And here we're gonna be starting with the cells, uh, processing them and preparing them for uh, at a scale that you would be able to use for a therapeutic. And so what that means is uh, concentration of the cells through an uh, instrument called the Rotea, uh, using Dynabeads to be able to pull out the CD3, CD28 population, adding that to the Cas9 uh, and donor uh, and guide RNA together and using this large scale xenon device, which can be used for electroporating billions of cells, and then expanding these out in our recommended media, the optimizer T-cell expansion media. And then finally, at analysis at the end. Uh, just a quick comment on the xenon. This is a new instrument that we have that can do this large scale as a single shot or a continual multi-shot approach to be able to deal with tens of millions to billions of cells, um, fully tracking software on it and supporting reagents are available if you're ready to move to that scale. Um, the setup itself, we started off with five times 10 to the seventh million cells uh, and then used the noted amounts of the Cas9 guide RNA and donor DNA. And we delivered this by electroporation, either with the neon system or the xenon system. And these recommended voltages, this is what we are using. And what you can see here is we get really good editing. Uh, in this case, oh, one comment that I forgot to make, sorry, is this is a uh, non-viral donor. We're not using AAV donor anymore. We're using straight, just double-strand DNA linearized donor now. And so what you can see again is the knockout is 94 to 97% of the cells are edited. And of that population uh, in the two runs with two different donors, 48% uh, to 68% to 60 of the cells have the donor knocked in in a non-viral way. When we check this with a killing assay, again, we see very effective killing for both donors compared to the unedited control. So both the smaller scale research use application as well as the large scale application um, therapeutic scale works very well. So in summary, you know, what we're talking about here is use high quality enzymes. Thermo Fisher is a very good supplier of these. We'll stand behind the performance and the ability to supply these. And we have full workflow solutions from enzymes, media and instruments to be able to help work through this. So that's the first part of this talk. Um, the second part that I wanted to go into uh, pretty quickly is just to talk about kind of the next generation concerns. And what you hear about a lot with gene editing is this concern about off target. Uh, what's happening? Is my Cas9 cutting where I don't want it to do? 
essentially will Cas9 cause a problem in this therapy? Um, so let me go through first, you know, when does off target matter? What's the risk? You know, what are you doing? If you're doing research use, the risk is very much controlled. You're not going to hurt anybody. And by using replicates, you can very much control for the risk against the risk of off target. However, if you're doing therapeutic, you really have to know what's happening and can this cut elsewhere? And especially, you know, when this is cutting, where is it cutting? Is the off target in, you know, non coding regions of the gene? Might not be that much of a risk. Is it in an oncogene? Yeah, that's going to be a high risk. So understanding that profile is very important. Uh, and then the types of off target or unwanted editing. Uh, are the standard off target. When we talk about off target, usually this just means that the guide RNA, that there, that it cuts at a sequence that's very similar to the guide RNA. A few bases up to generally, you're seeing three to four bases uh, potential similarity that it might cut at at different locations. Another thing is when you're doing multiplex, say I'm cutting at two different targets, uh, since you're making double strand breaks, there's the risk that they recombine across the chromosomes. So you get uh, these types of junctions that weren't expecting. This is low, but this definitely can happen and is seen when you do multiplex. So if you're knocking out track and you're also knocking out a couple of other T cell genes to help make your treatment better, this is a risk, especially if you're trying to do it all in one shot. Another is if you're using a donor is does the donor go where you want it to go? Sometimes it's gonna go uh, at, the, at where you're targeted and you made your cut, but it potentially can also go at these off targets or just in fragile sites of the genome. So understanding where it is. And then finally, um, a more this risk is something that's becoming more and more apparent more recently, is the idea of large deletions at the site of the cut. So you're making a cut and instead of getting these small indels, you're getting large deletions, thousands of bases. And when you're getting thousands of bases deletions, you start maybe knocking out nearby genes. And in some cases, you can knock out the whole distal end of the chromosome arm. And so being able to measure this or check for these things as you're figuring out your strategy are important. I'm gonna focus on the first one. And for that, um, the main question is, again, around how do you measure this? The way that we measure this is through sequencing. And sequencing, we use an approach called TechSeq, which is very similar to GuideSeq to be able to discover what's going on. And then this is followed up with uh, targeted sequencing to be able to see if those areas that were discovered with TechSeq are actually happening in your cells. So TechSeq, the idea is you cut your genome, and when you're cutting it, you also are delivering a small double-strand donor tag. And this sequence is able to be integrated at your break, and then you can use this after you've sheared the DNA and end repaired it to be able to have an anchor to sequence out of, to be able to see what is the border regions, and then from that you can identify the chromosomal areas that you may be having an off-target happen. And when you get these chromosomal areas, you can then design PCR primers for each one of these and then do the experiment again without the double strand tag and see, do you see anything happening there? The reason why you need to do both is GuideSeq is discovery, but it's not quantitative. Uh, sometimes you're going to get high reads here that you never see in your cells. Uh, when you're doing this one, the TabSeq or the targeted amplicon, this is much more quantitative. You can see how many cells are actually being edited at the off-target locations. And these have both been published as has the GuideSeq. Um, off-target generally is gonna have rules. It's generally small variations to your guide sequence. It's most amendable to the five prime end. This is the most flexibility. Uh, and then there's also the requirement for the PAM. If you don't have your PAM, the risk of off-target is quite low. And so you can see all of these off-targets pretty much have the expected PAM, but Cas9 can also cut at an NAG or an NGA PAM 
sometimes. And then there's also the idea of bulges, where it's the sequence with an extra base or a deleted base. So very similar, um, but another base in there that can cause this. So when you're looking at these things, again, the question is, where are they cutting? Are they cutting in energetic regions, less risk, regulatory regions, more risk, introns, you know, maybe uh, exons, definitely higher risk, and oncogenes the highest. So identifying where they are is important to your risk profile. And then finally, as you look at all these things, you can use uh, these profile tools to be able to understand what's happened in your cells of interest. Uh, we have a design tool called True Design that allows you to design your uh, guide RNA experiment, as well as gives you a score about what your off-target risk is. Um, off-target, again, is mostly based off of uniqueness, and this is something that is helpful. If you have something with a high score, you generally have a low risk. If you have a very low score, you're in trouble. So the main strategies to minimize this uh, is use Cas9 as a protein format. As said, that minimizes your risk that it's going to hang around long term like plasmid does. Use a high scoring guide RNA. And then finally, um, we also have high fidelity Cas9s. And high fidelity Cas9s minimize the off target risk because they're more specific. However, they're not quite as active as the standard wild type. So we recommend using a wild type unless you know you have a guide RNA that has a strong off target. Okay. So I skip this. Um, the idea of specificity is you want to pick guide RNAs with a high score. And so we did this across scores from 50 up to 93. And when we did deep sequencing for these for off-target, these ones with high scores only had one noticeable off-target. When we dug into that deeper, we noticed all of these ones that did have an off-target, that off-target was a bulge sequence, which our algorithm didn't uh, look for. So again, if you use a high scoring guide RNA, the risk of off-target is quite low. So that's the first recommendation, but sometimes you don't have a high scoring guide RNA available. When we looked at the available high fidelity, so-called high fidelity Cas9s, one of the obvious things that came out is compared to wild type Cas9, the activity dropped off significantly with the specificity. So the ones with really high specificity had really poor cutting activity. So we wanted to um, identify a Cas9 that has high activity and high specificity. So our screening efforts there led to the one that we use. And so what I'm showing you here is the guide seek, the tag seek results. And you can see when you start with wild type, and this is a not a, that good of a guide RNA, there's all of these targets that can happen. When we checked a competitor available high fidelity, you can see that the off targets went down significantly. So the risk is reduced. But when we checked ours, you could see that a lot of these targets were completely removed. And this, again, is one with a guide RNA that is a really poor performing guide RNA, the HEC4 guide RNA that's used in several of the papers. So the risk and the number of events can be reduced significantly with our new HiFi Cas9 from Thermo Fisher. When you look at this, when you're designing out an experiment, again, if you look at the other supplier compared to wild type, compared to our true cut. If you do multiple guides, you can often find ones that are quite unique and have no off target risk. But sometimes again, those, those don't cut where you need to. So with the wild type, you can see I've only got nine of my guides are gonna be able to work. With a competitor, I've got 11 that I've been able to eliminate the off target. And with ours, you know, you're getting 14, you're getting really good clearance and the ones that are left are reduced in risk. So this is the idea that when you have to use a certain guide just because it's cutting very effectively, but you have an off target risk, that's when you consider high fives to be able to help eliminate that risk and uh, potentially push that uh, off target out of the picture.
So again, um, better cutting activity, or not better cutting activity, but lower off-target activity uh, across these. And then for cutting activity across all of these different targets, what we saw is you do have a trade-off. Hi-fis aren't as active as wild types, so sometimes you don't have quite as much cutting activity. And what this means sometimes is you have to use a higher dose to be able to get to the same cutting as you get starting off with the wild type. So in summary, uh, use um, we have CTS TrueCut Cas9 if you're looking towards a therapeutic application. We have the TrueCut HiFi Cas9 if you need to minimize your off-target risk. And then we also have several off-target services that this TegSeq approach can be done as a service on uh, whatever targets you're interested in. So thank you for your time and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Jason, for the wonderful presentation. And once again, to both speakers for sharing your expert insights on these topics. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible. In the event that we're unable to do so, representatives from Thermo Fisher Scientific will reach out via email with an answer. Also, please stay with us until the end of the webinar to participate in a survey and stand a chance to win an exclusive GiveCo's 60th birthday brick set. All right, it looks like we have quite a few questions coming in already. Um, perhaps we can get started with questions for Eric. So Eric, Eric, first question is, how do you choose your Cas9 nucleus reagent? Oh, that's a, a very good question. Um, it, it really depends on, on the application that you're working on and, and also the uh, ability to deliver payloads to your cells. Um, I, I would say that, you know, if you can easily deliver protein complexes, either using lipofection or, or, or electroporation to your cells, I would highly recommend to going the protein route. Um, you know, we, we have a number of different proteins there, a wild type version, a high fidelity one, as well as a, a cell therapy systems grade one. So a lot of different options there. Um, that said, you know, in, in certain cases, um, mRNA or plasmids may be more useful. For example, um, for in vivo editing, a mRNA is much easier to deliver than a protein right now. Um, so, you know, so something to keep in mind, but for the pluripotent stem cell workflow, I definitely recommend the, uh, the protein. Okay, great, thank you. For your next question, what Cas9 form and delivery method yields most efficient genome editing in pluripotent stem cells? Right, so the, it, it kind of ties in, into what I just mentioned, um, but, but I think, you know, again, for, for iPSC, the Cas9 protein pre-complex with the guide RNA Will, will yield the highest editing efficiencies in, in the iPSC. And, and as I had shown during the presentation, both uh, delivered with the lipofectamine stem as well as neon electroporator gives you uh, good editing efficiencies. Um, but if you're really going for the highest possible editing efficiency, I, I recommend that you deliver that Cas9 protein guide RNA complex with the neon electroporator because the, as I had shown, the efficiency is significantly higher. Okay, thank you. And we've got one more question here for you. Why is cloning of edited stem cells needed? Right. So in, when you're thinking about a disease model, um, you know, ideally you want every single cell in your culture to have the mutation um, or the genome edited uh, portion uh, in, in your culture, right? And so get, getting 100% editing efficiency, especially when we're talking about SNP changes, is pretty much impossible uh, in iPSC right now with the tools available. So the easiest way to get around that and to have a culture with 100% of the cells having the um, 
uh, genome edit of choice, you know, cloning is the easiest way to do that. Um, and, and as I mentioned, you know, it's fairly easy to do that in iPSC right now. Um, I mean, the caveat there is that you have to use reagents that are optimized for it. So, um, you know, if you use laminin 5 to 1, which is a matrix that's been um, specifically developed for single cell survival of iPSC, as well as using the Stemflex medium, which um, supports single cell survival as well, um, you can be very successful in, in isolating iPSC clones. Thank you, Eric, for answering these questions. We'll now proceed with questions for Jason. All right, Jason, your first question is, how do I choose between a Hi-Fi Cas9 and Wild-type Cas9? So when I'm looking at that, there's, there's kind of two views. Uh, the first is just effectiveness. If you need really uh, the best cutting, oftentimes the Wild-type Cas9 does cut the best, as we talked about earlier. Um, if you've got a persistent off-target, uh, that this is a guide that is performing really well, you're getting good um, donor delivery at that location, but there is a known um, off-target that you need to get rid of, then oftentimes we'll see how well the Hi-Fi compares. In many of the targets that we checked, Hi-Fi did perform equally to Wild-type, there's just some of them that it did not. So there is that performance consideration. Some labs though, they use Hi-Fi across the board because they wanna minimize off-target risk in everything. So they've made the decision to just optimize along the lines of a Hi-Fi reagent and not use Wild-type at all. So it's kind of, there's different views with that. Uh, I use both enzymes, but I think either way is, is appropriate. Okay, great, thank you. Our next question, are there ways to minimize double strand break induced deletions? So when we were talking about what can happen when you do an edit, uh, there is that risk that whenever you make a double strand break, there is the potential for large deletions or loss of the chromosome arm. Uh, this is something that the field is actively looking at, and I'm not aware of a way to reduce that risk with a nuclease that makes a double strand break. So this is more of something to be checking for and determining if it matters for you. There are alternative technologies. You may have heard of things like base editor or prime editing, and these are working off of the idea that you're nicking instead of making a double strand break to try and minimize that type of outcome. Okay, thank you. And one other question here for you, can you do multiple edits at the same time and how many? So we, you can. Um, the neat thing about the protein complex is you can uh, assemble multiple RNPs and then put them all together. You can even just add the uh, guide RNAs as a pool into your protein and they'll, they'll self-assemble. Um, so we've done up to four at the same time. And the neat thing that you see there is that whether you deliver them individually or in multiplex, you get the same efficiency. You don't see any loss of activity by doing multiplex. However, the risk is that when you do multiplex, you are making two cuts at known areas in the genome and you do have a risk of them recombining and so there's some strategies to try and minimize that risk where you essentially do sequential cutting you'll cut with the one and then once the cells have recovered you'll dose them again with cas9 and cut with the other this again works well with the protein because the protein turns over rapidly you would not be able to do with the, this with the plasmids because the plasmid persists for days to weeks and so that's it's it's doable. Well, thank you, Jason, for your answers uh, to these questions. This wraps up our Gibco Galaxy Tour webinar today. I would like to thank Eric and Jason for sharing their knowledge and experiences, which I am sure will be helpful to researchers working in the genome editing field. A big thank you to our audience for joining us today and for submitting interesting questions. For those questions that we were unable to answer today, we will follow up um, with an answer via email. 
We hope all of you have gained more knowledge today that will help to enhance your lab skills. We would also like to thank Lab Roots and our sponsor, Thermal Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to ask everyone to take our survey at the end of the webinar to tell us your feedback. When you complete the survey, you'll be entered to a drawing to win an exclusive Gibco's 60th birthday brick set. This webcast can be viewed on demand. Lab Roots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. We hope to see you again for our Gitco Galaxy Tour webinar next year. Thank you and goodbye for now.